Good afternoon, everybody. Hope you guys are doing great. Hope you had a great uh, Memorial Day and you're ready to finish up the school year. Maybe you're already out. Some of you are, I know. Um, I had a request. I actually had two requests. I probably wouldn't have done this. I got a request on the AT side saying, why do you care about this Arduino thing? Uh, and then I got a request from the tech side asking uh, if I would make a video or, or explanation about why the addition of uh, USB mass storage to Arduino is so important for AT and why it matters for us. And to be honest, I tried to make a really short video and edit it down so that it could probably be shared more easily. And I don't like doing that anymore. So I'm making a live video. Uh, I am going to put off your questions till the end. If you want them, type in the, uh, in the Facebook thing and I will read them. But I thought I'd walk through a little bit about why this is important, why I think this is important. It is and uh, what it's going to mean for, uh, what it might mean for AT over the next uh, six months or so. So uh, what are we talking about? We're talking about, um, let me turn off that, there you go. We are talking about um, a new feature that was developed by uh, Adafruit. And basically they have added the ability to um, expose a USB drive, like a thumb drive, uh, on your computer when you plug in an Arduino. So if you've got like a little Arduino compatible, like one of these, uh, and you plug it in, uh, it will now show up or can now show up as a USB drive. And you can access files on it, you can drag files on it, you can edit files on it. And this is huge. It is huge for AT. And to kind of explain why, I want to remind you guys uh, about Ella. I'm sure you guys haven't forgotten about Ella. Uh, Ella uh, is um, one of our earliest successes here. Uh, we, we, we love the work we did with her and with Max up in Maryland. Um, we made a device that allowed Ella to control her power chair. She basically had two switches. Um, right turned right, left turned left, and both went forward. Uh, we added uh, some additional logic in there so that she could kind of curve more easily. Uh, and it was a, a huge success. So she was able to uh, just use the the switches that, that she had access to because with SMA, she's got it? limited motion. Are they do a good and, job? And um, we worked with uh, a team cool. from, from uh, Penn High School in Indiana done, and Ella. made a device that that really did uh, yeah, that did work. And a lot of you might not realize that that, is, that was an Arduino device. We took an Arduino device, a lot like this one. It actually is a older version of this chip. Um, and we programmed it to, to read her inputs and use relays to, to kind of fake out her power chair into thinking she had three switches. So this, this totally worked. And, um, you know, we've, uh, let me see if I can kind of show you a little more here. There. So, um, there you go. So, uh, right here is the, the device we made at the upper right. It's got the relays on it. Here's what it looks like underneath her power chair underneath that. And there's kind of the crew that put it together. Uh, this shows Max, uh, uh, Jonathan Lasco, Max's dad, did the original prototyping for it. So all this was done in Arduino. And a lot of you liked the success that we had. And I love the success that we had. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but uh, what you probably didn't see was the kind of the pain we went through. Um, we used these guys. We used the pen team very much as uh, an Arduino team for, for a little bit. Um, when you think about uh, when you think about the devices we're making, they seem simple. Right turns right, left turns left, both goes forward. It is simple. Uh, when we put first pushed that out, though, I got feedback from Erica that said it doesn't work. Right? It doesn't work the way we want it to. She'll get all lined up, and when she says go forward, it shifts to the right. And what was happening was she was trying to hit both buttons together, but one would hit a little bit before the other. Right? Her timing wasn't perfect and it would shift before it went forward or it wouldn't stop exactly when she wanted or, or things like that all these are configurable right all these are things that we could add parameters to make this work for her well so we could add a little bit of a delay that says okay if i see the right button i'm going to wait a half a second or a quarter second i think we ended up around a quarter second uh, and see if the other switch goes down as well uh, that gave us enough to give her enough time to get both fingers down when she wanted to go straight it really stopped the jerkiness and things like that. Um, and that one parameter, those actually was two or three parameters in there, um, they took forever to get right. And the reason they took forever to get right was that every time we needed to change them, we needed to send David from the, the high school team over. Uh, he had to plug in his laptop, which had the Arduino IDE on it. 
He had to make a change, recompile, push that new code down. They could try it out, see if it was the right numbers or not, uh, and try it again. Uh, and it, it just kind of took forever. It probably took weeks longer than it should have. So um, about three months later, I guess, the CircuitPython team really kind of announced how that was going to work. And we kind of shifted. And, and I, I want to be clear, I'm like a, I'm a C programmer. I, I've been programming in C and C++ and Java and all kinds of things with curly braces since the 90s, since the, the 80s, right? Um, Python isn't really my native language. I'm not a huge fan. I'm becoming more of one, but I wasn't really a huge fan uh, of Python as a, a language to develop for embedded things. Um, but we went to it for a simple reason. It exposes a hard drive when you plug in the chip. In fact, I've got a, a device here. Uh, this is a version of the Sip and Puff that Jim's using. And I owe Jim an update, and I'm sorry. But um, on this one, we actually did it in CircuitPython. We did it intentionally because uh, when I plug this device in, not only does it show up as a keyboard and a mouse, it also shows up as a drive. So I'll show you just real quickly kind of what that looks like, maybe, yeah. So right here, you can see, <laughs> maybe, let me see if I can make this so you can see it. Um, probably not. Well, sort of. So um, let me get rid of my, there you go. So here. There you go. So this is the drive that shows up when you plug this in. You'll see that there is a uh, there is a file called main, which is the actual program. But there's also a file here called Morse Maps. And, and what it does, and I'll try to make this easier for you guys to read on the screen. I can make this bigger. What this does is it actually has the ability for Jim himself to go in and change which codes go to which letters. So this is, you know, sip, puff, puff becomes D. And if he wants to add things like up and down arrows or escape keys and things like that, Jim can modify them. And it also lets him go in and make changes to the actual code to say, all right, here are the two thresholds for how hard you have to sip or puff uh, for it to work. Here's a debouncing factor, which how, is how long it's going to wait between sips and puffs, how long the accept delay is. These are all the things that we had to modify. What's neat is that Jim actually uses the sip and puff device uh, in, in order to modify that file and configure it for himself. That's huge, right? That's huge. It, it lets him change over time. It lets him adapt to a new situation that he's in. Um, it lets him add shortcuts. What he really wants me to do is to let him control his mouse, which I should be working on, but I'm making videos instead. Um, so it is absolutely enormous that he can change that device himself. And he doesn't need an IDE, and we don't have to get him a, a user interface or a screen. He doesn't have to pair it to his phone. We don't have to have an SD card that he can um, you know, push in and out to change it. Um, Jim wouldn't be able to do that, right? He has, uh, he has a, a, basically a sever of his spinal cord. He's not going to do that. Um, so the ability to configure a device by changing a, uh, a USB drive that shows up that represents that device is huge. It is the reason why I haven't done an Arduino project since Ella, really, not a major one. Uh, I've helped people on projects, but really we, all of the things that we've done since then have been done in CircuitPython. And you can talk to Chris Young and John Jordan and a bunch of people who really disagree with me, uh, disagree with me, really disagreed with me about, um, about moving to Python uh, because this wasn't, this wasn't the big driver for them. They didn't, they don't, they don't like Python as much or they didn't. I think they have come around. I think that if you told them, you know, okay, Arduino can now configure your device by editing a text file, they would never have, have jumped ship and, and come along as we did more and more Python, but it's huge. So this really is something that reopens um, the Arduino world for us. It allows us to uh, configure these files, uh, just add a simple text file, right? I mean, there's any file parsers for Arduino. We could use a JSON file. There's lots of things that people can edit with a normal, you know, WordPad or, or you know, Notepad. Edit the file, hit save, it's done, right? 
your, your, your software can then read that file and be configured by it. That's really what it's about. It's not necessarily about adding the WAV files or the GIF files or, or things like that. There are uses for that. I have a I have a project I'm working on right now that will absolutely use that feature uh, out of Circuit Circuit Python. But um, this is really about the configuration. It lets you with a simple text file, which everybody can edit. Everybody, whether you're on a Mac or a PC or a Chromebook, everybody can edit a text file on a USB drive, and that's what it's all about. So I hope that answers the questions. Uh, for those of you who are in the tech area, whether you're like on the Arduino team or working on Lua or any of the other, you know, the Cypress team, anybody who's working on any environments that you think uh, AT could use as a, as a programming environment, please realize that if we don't have a way for our end users to configure the, uh, the device, we're going to use one of the other methods. There are you know, MicroPython, CircuitPython, Lots of these things give us this ability, and I'm delighted that, uh, that Adafruit has added this one to Arduino. So I think that's kind of what I wanted to get across. Uh, I will look for any questions. I don't think I'm going to find any, um, but I will check. I don't think so. Uh, and nah, we're good. All right, so if you guys have any questions, post them wherever you see this video. I will respond to them. Uh, if you disagree with me, be nice when you disagree with me. Uh, well, this is all free, remember. And uh, I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.